So let's pray, and then we'll move on here. Lord, we, uh, we're thankful to be able to gather like this, and uh, every week try to pause and just give thanks, uh, because we are blessed to come into this room, to be able to sing and to share with one another, to study your word, to ponder some things. Lord, what a great privilege it is. And I'm thankful, Lord, that all over this building there are adults meeting and studying your word, and there are uh, sixth graders and children of all ages and teenagers, and uh, there are volunteers teaching them. And I'm thankful, Lord, and I'm thankful for the adults who are preparing meals and serving those meals and cleaning all that up. Lord, thank you for providing all of that. And I pray that tonight you would speak into the lives of the children especially, and the teenagers. Uh, reveal Jesus to them. And Lord, we pray uh, for those names that we've mentioned tonight, and these names on our prayer list for Donna Dinkinson and Jean Felgner. Lord, we pray for Jerry Cox and her whole family that you would uh, provide what they need during this time. We pray that you would uh, just comfort them. Lord, we pray uh, for Lois Sinton, who has fallen again. and uh, We pray for Madge, who will be having this eye procedure on uh, Friday, and for Michelle as she walks with her her mother through this time. And I pray, God, that you would uh, provide for what they need. Lord, we put before you all of these names. We know that you're aware of every one of these precious lives and the situations in which they live. We ask, God, that you would uh, reveal yourself to them, give them peace, provide a way for them, encourage them, sustain them, heal them. Uh, Lord, we trust you with these situations. Lord, we are thankful for uh, the opportunity to participate in Gospel Fest. So thankful for the musicians and uh, sharing their talents and their giftedness with us. And I uh, pray, God, that you would bless their ministries because they have blessed us. Uh, and Lord, as we look ahead into the coming weeks, there are a lot of important things going on. And uh, leading up to Easter and even beyond that, uh, Lord, life has a way of moving on. And I pray, Father, that you would help us to have good perspectives to trust you as our shepherd as you guide us through uh, green pastures, beside still waters, through the valley of shadow, and then out again back into green pastures. Lord, thank you for being our guide. And finally, Lord, we pray for Wes Robbins and our youth ministry this weekend, and uh, for all of the churches that will be participating. I pray for the adults that will be leading, and for every student in Aransas County that will be participating in Impact Weekend, I pray, God, that you would speak into their hearts and lives in a very real and supernatural way that would change them, that would give them a hope and a future, that would uh, radically deliver them, perhaps. And I pray, God, that it would be widespread and catch like wildfire uh, among that generation. And so, Lord, whatever you're going to do, we celebrate it even now. Thank you for uh, paying attention to the young people who live in our county. Now, Lord, as we open your word, we ask that you would speak to us. Uh, we, We are listening, and we love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I was going to say something, but it's gone now. We'll trust the Holy Spirit with that. So if you have your Bibles, I'm going to be in Matthew 2 tonight. I'm thankful uh, last week for James Fuller, who led us. Uh, He did a great job, and uh, he deserves more chances, probably, if he hadn't uh, hadn't decided against it in his own mind. But I hope that he'll be uh, open to uh, sharing with us more. He did a great job. So before James shared with us last week, I was going through some of the Christmas narratives to uh, look at these these different passages. And so tonight I want to to look in Matthew chapter 2. 
This, I know I preached out of this uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I think, but none of us remember. And so this will all be new. But uh, this is the second chapter of, of Matthew uh, wraps up Matthew's nativity narratives. And uh, next Wednesday, if the Lord hasn't returned yet, and if we're not all frozen to death, then uh, when we meet next week, we'll look at the, how Luke ends his nativity narratives. And uh, especially uh, the proof that Jesus was a teenager. So we'll look at all of that uh, next week. Tonight we'll look here in Matthew 2. So Matthew's infancy stories are quite different from Luke's. And uh, here in the second chapter, Matthew tells of the visit of the Magi from the east. Uh, He'll narrate for us the flight of the Holy Family into Egypt and Herod's slaughter of the innocents in Bethlehem. And so we'll talk about all of that tonight. I'm going to answer all of your questions and clear everything up for you, right? Yeah, I don't buy it either. Um, Matthew, I think, especially in reminding us that Jesus is the king who has been promised and now he's come, uh, he's clearly interested in chapter 2 in uh, expressing the, the way that God protected Jesus and his family and sustains them so that God's salvation purposes can be accomplished. And what we see in the second chapter of Matthew is that there is opposition every step of the way. Uh, Tonight we'll look just at the the opposition that can be seen at the time, but I've talked before in Matthew 2, you have to keep in mind uh, Revelation, I can't remember, 12 I think, where it talks about the red dragon and all of that. There's there, there are natural things at work, and then there are supernatural things opposing God's activity every step of the way. And what Matthew does is he shows us uh, how God is not thwarted. And you and I need to keep that in mind. Because in your life, uh, in your circumstances, And then if you turn on the news or you start reading what's on the internet, uh, it looks like the wheels have come off. And it is easy to get discouraged. What you and I need to learn as people of faith, that if we're going to walk with Christ, there are seen realities and there are unseen realities. And in both, our God reigns. He's not lost us. He's not lost the thread of your story. He's not lost control. Uh, in my house, uh, if in my house, there are certain places that the remote controls are supposed to go to the TV. And if some house monkey doesn't put those, then it takes a long time to locate them and turn the TV on because I am no longer able to walk across the room and turn the TV on manually and get it to the channel I want. I've got to have that remote control. Do you have this problem? And so if you've lost that remote, I I can't watch TV. I have no control. And I know that it sometimes seems like that the Lord has lost or misplaced the remote control of the universe. Yeah. It's useless. She said she had to give her TV away because she lost her remote control. The TV is completely useless. You don't have that. You got to remember that you know, the Lord, our appearances don't always reveal the truth of things. And so you have to trust that, that God is still moving everything according to his timing and his own plan to accomplish the purposes that he has in mind. And so that's what we see here in the second chapter of Matthew. All right, let's look. I'm going to start reading Matthew 2, verse 1. 
After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, I'm sorry, it helps if I put on my glasses, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw a star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no, me- are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people, Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After that, they had heard After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold of incense, and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. All right. So going back up to verses 1 and 2, how long after Jesus' birth do these events take place? So we assume two years. A comparison of verses 7 and 16 suggests that at least two years have elapsed since the birth of Jesus. And uh, verse 11 describes Joseph and Mary living in a house now. So obviously they have left the temporary lodgings described in Luke chapter 2 verse 7. Uh, If you believe that it was an inn or a guest house or somebody's family home, family room, whatever, from, chap- from Luke chapter 2. Wherever they were, when Jesus was born, they are in a house of some kind now on their own. Now, the birth of Jesus probably should be dated around 6 B.C. Uh, from the historical records that we have, we know that Herod the Great died in 4 B.C. And so if these events happen in the year 0 A.D., then Herod would have already been dead. So what we know is that the calendar you and I go by was dated wrong because of, and I'm going to name him, Dionysius Exegus did bad math and had bad information and did bad math, and so he got the dates of the Christian calendar completely wrong. So he's off by about six years. I know you don't care, but I do. All right? So, uh, Jesus' birth also almost certainly did not occur on December 25th. Why do we celebrate Christmas on December 25th? Okay. (laughs) Linda said there's a pope that decided that, which is probably true uh, because that's the way most things happen. So, when... In the first centuries of Christianity, uh, the Romans celebrated a a holiday called Saturnalia on December 25th, and all of the Romans had the day off. And so the Christians thought, well, we have the day off. Why don't we celebrate it on that day? And so that's how they linked celebrating the birth of Jesus with December 25th. It's likely that Jesus was born sometime in the spring because it would be in the spring that shepherds in Bethlehem would have been out in the fields with their flocks at night instead of having them pinned up. And the shepherds needed to watch over them because it's in the springs that the spring lambs would be born. 
And so the, there, all the shepherds needed to be you know, on hand there to protect uh, the newborns and the sheep while they're giving birth and to facilitate all of that. All right, so they would have been out in the fields at night watching their flocks in the spring. And then Matthew tells us about Herod the Great. What do you know about Herod the Great other than he was great? He was bad, he was evil. That's an understatement, yes. What do you remember? Anything? All right, he was not. He was half Hebrew, half Gentile, uh, half Jewish, half Jew, uh, Gentile. Idumean. Uh, so he was not a fullborn. Uh, how did he become king of the Jews? Connections in Rome is exactly right. And so Herod uh, the Great spent part of his childhood in Rome. He was uh, probably uh, a schoolmate of uh, Augustus Caesar. Uh, when they were all growing up, and so they all knew each other. They were part of that class. And so Herod was able to leverage his uh, half-Jewish heritage uh, with his uh, probably political connections to uh, get control of this region of the Middle East. And he, uh, uh, Caesar, who knew Herod well, proclaimed him to be king of the Jews. So that's how he got uh, control. Probably in about 37 B.C., and that will be on the test, so I hope you wrote that down. He was known as a great builder, and so even today there are buildings in Jerusalem, especially that Herod had built for himself and for others. He was known for being a shrewd diplomat in his dealings with both the Romans and the Jews. He was also famous for his oppressive taxes, and if you could not pay your taxes, you were conscript, conscripted, into building all of his great building projects. And so that's how you made a living. As Herod grew older, he became paranoid. And uh, because, uh, because of his personality, I guess, he had a lot of wives, which meant that he had a lot of children, especially a lot of sons, and every one of those sons was a potential heir. He was afraid that one of these rascals his offspring were going to overthrow him. And so uh, he had several of his wives put to death, several of his sons put to death, so much so that Caesar Augustus once joked that it was better to be Herod's pig than his son. Uh, and the word for pig and the word for son in Greek are very close, and so it was a play on words. But Herod was famous for, for killing his children. He just was a, a terrible, terrible person. Yes. All right. And then Matthew mentions for us the Magi. What do we know about the Magi? From the east. They followed the star. Yes. All right. Three gifts. So we assume they're three people, mm -hmm. but in reality, it may not. Yes, all of our nativity sets are probably wrong. Uh, yes, yes, so disappointing. Yeah, probably came from the region of Persia. Uh, they were magi. They weren't kings, but uh, they were probably priests uh, known as wise men. They uh, would have combined uh, observations of the sky, astronomy, with interpreting what the movement of the stars mean, astrology. And so uh, they were known for being skilled astronomers and shrewd astrologers, interpreting the signs. And one of the things that they were known for, in Persia especially, was for knowing when the signs said, who was to be king. And so the Magi had a role as being kingmakers, of saying, this is what the gods, the stars, the skies are saying about who should be ruling over us at any given time. And so if you were wanting to lay claim to a throne and take 
political and military power, it helped to have the Magi validate your claim. You following me there? And so they played both political and perhaps religious roles and uh, were prominent figures. They make their way to Jerusalem, and what did they want to know from Herod? What child? Okay. Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? What an interesting question to ask Herod the Great. So uh, the Magi's question emphasizes the word born. And the way the grammar is put together, it, it makes it clear that they ask about the child who, is, who has the legitimate claim to the throne of Israel, because clearly, Herod, you don't. And that's exactly the way Herod appears to take it. How do they know that this child even exists? What do they say? Yep. We saw his star. The heavens have shown him. Uh, so don't bother lying about it or hiding him, Herod. We know he's here. We saw his star. Where is he? Uh, a new star in the sky was supposed to have heralded the birth of a significant person like a new king. So, based on their natural observations of the movement of the stars and the heavens, they assumed that the king of the Jews had been born. And why had the Magi come? What did they say? To worship him. To honor him. Uh, which is a remarkable thing for a foreigner to say about a Jewish king, especially at this time and at this part of the world, and uh, it's very significant for what comes ahead. So what was Herod's response? He's disturbed. That's what, does anybody's Bible say anything different? Disturbed? All right. Troubled? Okay, it's not bad. Uh, disturbed is kind of a weak translation. Uh, turmoil or terrified would be more accurate. He was greatly upset at what happens. And then Matthew says that all Jerusalem was with him. Everybody was stirred up. And they were probably, uh, by referring to all Jerusalem, it's likely Matthew is saying the religious leaders and the political leaders who dominated this, the city they were the ones who were stirred up because they were all connected to Herod. And the Magi had already started off by saying, where's the real king of the Jews? And now they're all going, what? Because if Herod wasn't in power, all of these guys were going to be out of a job. And well, you know how that goes here in America when politicians are out of a job. It's an ugly sight. All right, so uh, in verse 4, it refers to two key groups of religious leaders in Jerusalem, the chief priests and then the scribes or the teachers of the law. These were uh, supposed to represent the religious life of Israel, and uh, especially the scribes. The scribes had the job of copying the Old Testament from one scroll to another and passing on the word of the Lord, and the process of doing that Nobody knew the Old Testament like the scribes. And so they were viewed as being experts in the Torah, especially the law. And uh, the priests represented the Lord to the people and represented the people to the Lord. And so they are the uh, religious, everything connected to religious power in Israel is bound up in the priests and, uh, and the scribes. All right. So, according to Matthew, when Herod finds out and he's disturbed and everybody's disturbed with him, he calls together the chief priests and the scribes. And what does Herod want to know? So, don't miss this. The king of the Jews, Herod, doesn't know where the Jewish Messiah is going to be. He's, it's like he's never read. Not only has he never been to Sunday school, 
but he probably hasn't read the Old Testament at all. So, so he's wanting to know, well, what do the Scriptures say about this Messiah or the Christ, the King of the Jews? Where is he supposed to be born? And so the religious leaders being uh, well-educated, obviously they know exactly the answer. It's from Micah chapter 5, verse 2, and the answer is Bethlehem, a small city about five miles uh, south of Jerusalem. And uh, they, they understand the text from Micah to dis- be describing the Messiah. So what does the quote from Micah say about the child who was to be born? All right, he will rule. Uh, so this has the idea that uh, uh, the Old Testament, the, the God's people continually struggled because they didn't always have good kings, right? So here you have a prophecy saying that there's a child who's going to come. Uh, he's going to be born in this place. And he's going to be this great ruler. And also connected to that word is the word shepherd. And so uh, this ha- someone who doesn't have just political power, but someone who is able to give guidance and pastoral care and a sense of compassion to God's people. Uh, this was the Messiah, their hope for the future. This is what they were waiting for, they're longing for. This person who would come and be this righteous ruler this great shepherd, and who would uh, restore Israel from its exile, from uh, uh, bringing the people back from all the places of the world, restoring them to the Holy Land, to Jerusalem, and establishing the reign of God, supposedly, there in Jerusalem. That was what the Messiah was supposed to do. All right, so in verses 7 and 8, Herod calls the Magi back together, and what are, what are his instructions? All right, why did he want them to report back to him? So that he could go and worship. Do you believe him? Well, you know the end of the story. But of course you don't believe him. Uh, we know from the end of verse that the end of verse eight is a bold-faced lie because of what happened later. So he's definitely being deceptive. Uh, he's been publicly insulted by the Magi. Uh, he definitely views whatever child they're talking about as a potential threat. And Herod, being Herod, knows that you can solve a lot of political problems through a well-placed murder, right? And that's what he has in mind. All right. It's an interesting... uh, Lewis is asking why why wouldn't he have had them followed, maybe, which is an interesting question. We don't know. Other than Herod did not want to appear to have any kind of mischief going on. And so he trusted the Magi. Why wouldn't they do what he said? He doesn't have any reason not to trust them. Yeah. Very uh, under the radar, for the most part, the birth of Jesus altogether. That is true. All right. So in verses 9 and the verses that follow, how do the Magi find their way to the child? They follow the star. So let me ask you fine, educated Christians, how do you interpret that? Uh, They followed the star, which led them where? Okay, what does it say? To the the place where the child was. It stopped over the place where the child was. So, did the star move? Is that how you understand it? 
The fire? Okay. I don't know. That's, that's, that's as good an explanation as any. Uh, have you seen the Marfa lights out in West Texas? I saw what they said was the Marfa lights. I'm not sure what I saw. Well, I mean, that's as good an explanation as any. Um, we don't know what that is. What I think Matthew is trying to say here is that something extraordinary and supernatural happened that was out of the ordinary enough that the Magi recognized it as being a divine guidance. And it led them directly to the child. I don't know what it was. Uh, the star. They... they Whatever that means, and did it move, and uh, how did how did it how did they know it was directly over that house? And I don't know how all of that works. Matthew doesn't say, which is frustrating, but uh, something supernatural definitely happened that guided the Magi to the exact place where the Holy Family was. Um, how did the Magi respond to the child when they found him? worshipped him. It says in verse 10, they've, when they saw the star and knew they were being led, they had exceedingly great joy. They fall down on their faces. They prostrate themselves and they worship him. And then they open up their gifts to honor the newborn king of the Jews. Uh, gold, frankincense, and myrrh were all the kinds of things that you would give a newborn king. And so a lot of people will go into saying the meaning of the different gifts. I have no idea. Matthew doesn't indicate that the gifts have any meaning beyond that these are gifts fit for a king. And they were expensive. These were, uh, these were worthy gifts. And it's likely this is how God provided everything that the Holy Family would need to make their escape to Egypt. And we'll get to that shortly. So Matthew simply saying that these, uh, these pagan kings from the east recognize the child, worship him, and give, open up their gifts to honor him uh, and believe that they had been led by God to do so. So the child is born in obscurity, under the radar, in, a, in, a, in an obscure village, Bethlehem is just nowhere. It's in the middle of nowhere. Um, nothing important happens in Bethlehem. And yet, that's where Jesus is. And God draws these foreign kingmakers there to recognize his son as the king, to worship him, and to give him the, these gifts. It's an extraordinary story. Uh, Let's look at verse 13 now. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you. For Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt, I called my son. So, we've talked before over my uh, puzzlement over how God spoke to Joseph in dreams, but he did. I hope God is not speaking to me through dreams, because my dreams don't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, but Joseph, and this was common in Scripture, you know, to ha have dreams and to to interpret that as the Lord's guidance. And that is exactly what Joseph did. And he, he goes to Egypt. Why Egypt? Uh, to fulfill prophecy? Out of Herod's reign and influence? Uh, also, Egypt uh, was always where the Jews looked to when they needed help, when push came to shove. There was a large Jewish community who lived in Alexandria in Egypt at this time, and so there would have been people there, maybe even family there, that they could connect with, and it would have been a safe place for them to go. 
So how did Joseph respond to the word of the Lord? He didn't waste any time, did he? He got up and went, which again, we've talked before, I can't say enough about the faith of Joseph. Uh, He trusted the Lord, he obeyed the Lord. Uh, Even listening to what the Lord said to him in his dream. They leave during the night under cover of darkness. Uh, They become what are essentially political refugees from Herod's kingdom. And they hide out until Herod's death, uh, which, as I've already said, was in 4 B.C., and when the angel tells them to return. So in the Old Testament, you have the Exodus narrative where God brought his people out of Egypt and led them into the Promised Land. And here, God is bringing salvation to the world by calling his son Jesus out of Egypt who will bring all sinners into the presence of God. And I think Matthew wants us to make that connection. All right, verse 16. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys of Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Uh, This is a terrible story. Uh, Herod behaves in keeping with his murderous and paranoid personality and The massacre offers a classic example of the kind of overkill of which Herod was uh, not just capable, but guilty of. And he knew from what the Magi had told him that this newborn king was probably under the age of two. And so in order to make sure that he got him, he orders the death of all of the boys who fall in that age range. Now... Those of us, I mean, those who study the the scriptures and especially history and uh, want to refute stories like this in the New Testament will often make the observation that there are no historical records from Herod's time or from the Roman Empire that substantiate and back up what Matthew has told us here, including uh, nothing in Josephus, the Jewish historian. If anybody was going to write about it, you'd think it would be Josephus. The answer to that, I think, is that Bethlehem was just a small, rural, uh, podunk place out in the sticks. It was not important. It would not have involved, there, not many people would have lived there, and so there's a chance that Herod may have ordered the death of 20 boys. While a tragedy, that was small potatoes compared to to the widespread slaughter that Herod, we know, absolutely perpetrated during his reign. This was, would have been just a blip on the radar for historians in Herod's day. The kind of thing where they would have said, oh, he killed 20 boys in Bethlehem? Oh, that's terrible. But did you hear what he did over here? You know, he did these terrible things. And so this was nothing. Uh, ancient historians were, were concentrating on great political military exploits, big stories that demonstrated the character or the failings of some of these leaders, uh, this would not have come up on their radar. So I don't think we should look to the other historical documents. However, there are other documents that we have from Jewish historians like Josephus who tell horrible stories of what Herod did. And so this is absolutely in character for Herod. Uh, Matthew quotes for us Jeremiah 31.15, which describes the children of Israel uh, being led away to the exile, to the Babylonian exile. Uh, And you have Rachel representing all of the mothers in in Israel, watching their children being taken away, uh, and the grief of the loss of all of that. So I'll just ask, I guess, with the time that we have, uh, and I know the children are going to come in here in a minute and kick us out. So, uh, As a believer, 
How do you interpret the account of the slaughter of the innocents? What's the meaning of this text for us in today's world? How would God allow such cruelty Your thoughts? Okay, <laughs> Kathy says it's a drop of the, in the bucket compared to the number of abortions. I'll just say that uh, historically speaking, and even in today's world, uh, God does not stop the death of innocent children. Innocent children have died throughout history. That's for sure. Why didn't he just deal with them? Yeah. So Rick is wondering why God just didn't do something extraordinary as a way of dealing with Herod. Uh, but he didn't. He didn't. Uh, some of Herod's boys reached a terrible end, but Herod himself did not. Yeah. <laughs> so Herod probably died of natural causes, probably uh, the side effects of some kind of uh, STD. Uh, which was common for people who lived a certain lifestyle in the ancient world. Uh, I will just say, uh, it's no surprise to any of you that terrible things happen in this world, right? There are tragedies. And people are capable of great evil on a grand scale and on very small scales. You know, very personal and very grand scales at the same time. All of that is true. And while I think the Lord <clears throat> is watching these things, I think He grieves over the things that trouble us and grieve us so, the truth is that God did not promise a happy ending for all of us in this world. The happy ending comes where? Amen. At the after, right? Uh, in eternity, where God, God's holiness and his justice will come into play and everything will be made right and everything will be made new. The uh, book of Revelation talks about the martyrs gathered around the throne of God saying, how long? How long will it be? How long do we have to wait until there's justice? And I pictured the children from Bethlehem the same way. Yes, when's Herod going to get in? You know. From the Holocaust, absolutely. I mean, and so we could talk about I mean, the, the suffering of innocence throughout time. Uh, why does the Lord let it happen? I have no idea, but he does. But there is a time coming, I believe, and I think as Christians we believe, we affirm, that the time is coming where things will be made right. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Matthew ends by telling us that the Holy Family returns from Egypt, and where do they go? To Nazareth, of all places. Now, there's already been talk in the town about who Jesus' father really is, and how did Mary get pregnant? There was all of that scandal, and uh, Joseph and Mary don't avoid any of it by going to live in Judea. They go right into the heart of drama, to Nazareth. And Mary especially has to face all of her family, all of those women there, and they raise Jesus. Jesus uh, Joseph raises Jesus as his own. Uh, uh, it couldn't have been easy. And, and Matthew tells us they went there because they thought it was safer. Uh, Herod, the... Herod's son that reigned in Nazareth and that region was safer than the one who reigned in Judea. And I understand all of that. But it was still extraordinary that Mary and Joseph would go home. Jesus later will say that a prophet gets no respect in his hometown. Jesus didn't get respect in Nazareth. But that's where Mary and Joseph chose to raise him. Never underestimate your impact on your hometown where your kinfolk are, 
your people, those knuckleheads, you know, your presence around them probably mattered more than we realize. Think about this. Matthew emphasizes the importance of understanding that Jesus fulfills Old Testament prophecy. God keeps his promises. Jesus is an example of that. He's a fulfillment of God's promises. Also, Jesus restores God's people and sinners from their exile. As, because of our sin, we are separated from the presence of God. The blood of Christ brings us home again. And I think Matthew begins to pick up on this theme. Matthew emphasizes that even Gentiles are included in God's redemptive plan. These foreigners from the east know exactly who Jesus is. And they bow down and they, they worship him. Matthew also tells us that Jesus is worthy of worship. However you worship, Jesus is worthy of that and more, right? Yeah. All of our honor, all of our treasure, all of, you know, Jesus is definitely worthy. And I think also Matthew would have us to understand that we do not always perceive the spiritual realities at work on the stage of human history. We must live like, like Matthew said Joseph did. We trust the word of the Lord. We obey the word of the Lord. And by doing that, we place ourselves, ourselves in the stream of God's activity on the stage of human history, moving everything to its appointed end. What I don't want to do is miss that by opposing God or doubting him, or turning away from him, or giving up on him. I want, to hang, I want to hang in there, regardless of what my circumstances demonstrating. Remember, the Lord is not finished yet. This is not heaven. Right? So we're still on our way. We're still on our way. All right. Final thoughts or questions? Matthew 2. Well, you've been very patient with me. Thank you. So next week, like I said, if we're not frozen, we'll be in Luke, uh, Luke chapter 2, especially uh, starting in verse 41 and after, if you want to read ahead. All right. Let me pray for us. We'll be done. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would help us, each and every one of us, to know your voice when you speak to us. Give us the capacity to trust your voice when you speak to us. Give us the grace to obey your voice when you speak to us. Our circumstances and uh, the events of, of human history sometimes are discouraging. And we think maybe that you've lost control of things, but remind us that you've not forgotten us, you've not gotten distracted, and that you're moving everything to its appointed end. And Lord, I know that this life has no end of trouble and grief and separation from those we love. I believe that the day is coming when all of that will end, and we will be together with you forever. And in that day, there will be real justice for those who have suffered in this world. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Until then, renew our faith. Uh, I pray, Lord, that you would bless these folks as they depart. May your will be accomplished in their lives. Lord, we love you and we trust you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.